We want to bring Deb in because she's the author of a text that we're using in one of our courses in our strategic fundraising program. And it's called Donor Cultivation and the Donor Life Cycle Map. And we've asked Deb to come here today to talk with us not just about the book, but more importantly about her motivation behind writing the book and how she really think it adds to the field of fundraising. Deb, could you start with just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? My background is a PhD from the Florence Heller School. I guess now it's called the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis. And I really, let's say, didn't plan a career, but my career happened where I kept one foot in academia all of the time, as well as in actual development positions. And by going back and forth, and also the background in uh, or from the Heller School, which really uh, teaches us how to affect social change, my thinking was, what's going on in this field of fund development? Why does it not make sense to me and how, as a change agent, could I have some impact for the long term? So tell us a little bit more about the book and um, how it brought, you know, how you were well, brought to want to write it. What happened was when I worked as a development officer, uh -huh. I did what I call cultivation. I wrote letters to donors. I picked up the phone and thanked them personally. I planned events. I uh, wrote annual reports and newsletters and used social media. And then when I moved from uh, full-time employment to working as a consultant in my own business, people would call me and they would say, you know, we hear you're a Cracker Jack fundraiser. Can you help us raise a half a million to a million dollars in the next six months to a year? That was kind of the model call because we lost a major donor. And the major donor could have been anything from a private family foundation to a public foundation to an individual, even a corporation. And what's so, interesting is that's kind of a typical kind of scenario, right? In, in a terms, consulting, right. And, and in a fundraising situation where somebody loses a major donor and they think something can happen in three to four months. Right, and that, that we're donor. suddenly going to be able to, you know, make snow come exactly. from the sky. Or rain may be the exactly. better way. Right. So what happened was I began to think about I, all these people. I'd ask them, well, what do you do to cultivate your donors? And no one could reply. So oh. I began to think very, very um, intensely whether A, cultivation really applied, whether that word applied to mm -hmm. what we did, and if so, what does it mean? And it does apply because cultivation means sure. to foster the growth of, and right. we want more money. We want to grow the number of donors we have. We want more money from those donors, but we also want them to give over more time. And I think that's where my thinking got pushed beyond uh -huh. where most fundraisers were at the time and I think still are. Because most fundraisers are thinking annual campaign, annual campaign. How do we get more in an annual campaign? How do we get our major donors to give us more annually? And my concept is, how do we keep our donors? Right, and that's the key thing. That's, that's different. the key, exactly. exactly. And how to approach that, which is very different than what a lot exactly. of traditional approaches look at. Well, the other piece that was in my mind, because I had spent so much time in endowment development, mm -hmm that I was really beginning to key in on if we kept a donor over the long term, no matter the size of the gift, we might be able to obtain that endowment gift, that last gift in the donor's well, journey with us. Right, because often um, fundraising professionals think, you know, somebody gives $50 a year, you know, they're at the sort of lower end and maybe they don't need as much cultivation. Right. But in fact, what you've been able to demonstrate that that's not the case. Right. 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 And that was my goal in writing the book to get us to change our framework mm -hmm. because I did it too. I remember when I worked for a local theater, you know, how, how can we get our major donors to give more? Well, let's see. If we make the top category 25000 instead of 10000 what can we give them back for 25000 
well, maybe we'll give them a parking place in front of the theater. Right, and that's a strategy that's used quite a bit right. still, I see, right. in terms of the levels of exactly. donors and what it is that you're going to get back and so on, but it doesn't really talk about motivation. Exactly, right? and also when you look at those recognition lists in playbills or mm-hmm. annual reports, never talks about the length of time someone right. has donated, and we don't honor our donors over the lifetime. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe you could talk a little bit more detail about what the framework is and you know how, how people can use it strategically in terms of developing their fund development programs. Absolutely. Um, the framework goes from first gift to what the designer of the framework. Number one, it's called the donor life cycle map. I found this. I oh, was okay. thinking in these terms. Gotcha. And then I found the actual graphic. Uh on the 101 fundraising blog many years ago and I grabbed it because the graphic goes from first donor, first gift, excuse me, to second gift, Uh to the next one is called second year active. And that means, aha, I want to get my donors more committed to us. I want them to be real um, strong supporters. In order to do that, I have to get them involved with my organization. I have to provide opportunities for them to actually, in the veritable, get their feet wet. So I might want to involve them in a -a phone-a-thon. I might want to involve them on a committee. I might want to give them, for those who've never been to my organization, a first-hand tour, et cetera and so forth. So I'm curious how that all ties into volunteer engagement, because I think a lot of what we read is certainly about younger people, is that their first step into philanthropy is as volunteers. And So do you see any correlation between that? Let's come back to that, because that's a good question. But let me finish with the donor life cycle maps. Okay, so after second gift, we try to move them into get second year active. Mm -hmm. Most people are going to say, I'm too busy. I don't want to. I have other organizations with which I'm involved. So we try to get the third gift. And the third gift sector is called multi-year active. Okay. So if you've noticed, I haven't talked about the size of the gift. Correct. I haven't said anything. It's all about keeping the gift. And the book talks about what tools you can use, such as thank you notes, uh, when you use a newsletter, when you use a brochure, mm-hmm. when you pick up the phone and make the call, when do you write a personal letter? The next sector is major or stretch giving major gift defined by the organization. Mm -hmm. How much do you want to call a a major donor? And some people say as low as 500. I've had people say 50,000. Right, exactly. So it can be anything. Right, Right, exactly. The stretch donor is someone who says, you know what, I can't be a major gift donor to you. I don't have the resources. But I am stretching as far as I can Mm -hmm. in order to make a gift. Right. And the final segment is ultimate gift. So the concept was, okay, how do we efficiently, ultimate is endowment. Thank you. That's what I thought, but I just want to clarify Ultimate is endowment. And it can be a current endowment gift. I give Bay Path University a million dollars for scholarships. (laughs) Yeah. So it could be outright today. Yeah, exactly. Or it can be in some kind of future gift through a bequest or an estate Mm -hmm. planning tool. Okay. And so the... What I said to myself was I would walk into offices as a consultant and see all of these boxes of materials and people didn't know what they were using for. They didn't even know why they printed them. So I began to say there has to be an efficient use, Uh a strategic and efficient use of tools around the donor lifecycle map to move the donor. So that's what this book is really about. What are those tools and how do you use them efficiently? How do you use them creatively so that the donor stays with you? Now back to your question about volunteerism because I don't want to lose that. Yeah, because I think it's an important point in terms of the engagement of people within that cycle, right? Right. And the volunteerism is absolutely the ability to bring donors closer to you, get them more involved with you. That's what the old-fashioned hospital auxiliaries are about when they still exist. And you find, and I would love to do the research, that the longer somebody volunteers with you, their gifts may be slight. Their gifts may be 25, 35, but those are where the endowment donors are. That would be really, really interesting research, yeah. and it wouldn't be surprising if that's exactly yeah. what was found. 
So why don't we talk a little bit about how this framework is actually different than what um, you've seen through your experience that people use in developing their fund development strategies and, and reaching out to donors. I think most fundraising officers, I like to differentiate, by the way, between fundraising and development. Fundraising is one time. Development is over time. So development is we want to create more donors. We want to create yeah, more money over the long mm -hmm. time. Fundraising is, you know, I'm going to try to raise a million dollars this year, two million next year, and three million the next the year beyond. Where my model is different, and I see this all the time, is that most people look at your major donors, most people use the donor pyramid. And the donor pyramid right, exactly. is like this, yep. and we focus on the top donors, and we may focus on the next level. And all these people at the base, those are the people who give us, those are the, the people who give us the least amount of money, but they're the most of them. I call that the template level, because we write template letters, would you please give to us this year? And if we get a response, we write, dear friend, thank you for so much for donating to us this year, and we're done. Okay. Right. So fundraisers, in my mind, look at the top, the top, and the top, and the top just gets thinner and thinner and thinner because we're trying to get fewer and fewer people to give us more and more money. It's a very dangerous strategy because if someone pulls out of that strategy, you could be left it's with a, a huge hole. A huge, it's hole, a huge hole. And I call it a lack of diversification because mm -hmm. you're dependent uh, upon, yeah. it's just like a portfolio, you're dependent upon a couple of stocks. One of those stocks goes belly up, and oh my gosh, the donor life cycle map is circular. It's about maintaining. So, yes, you want to move donors to larger gifts, major gifts, stretch gift. But the most important piece is you want to keep all of your donors. Right. You lose one or two, it really doesn't matter because you are always bringing new donors into the pipeline. And you're always trying to use cultivation tools to keep them. By the way, just one last thing. Yeah, sure. The donor pyramid does not look at endowment development. I have seen some donor Does it mean ma I, major gifts. Yeah, oh, it, if you look at the that. donor pyramid, it's fundraising. It's four or five levels with major gifts being at the top. Where is endowment in the pyramid? So some people who've tried to include endowment in the pyramid will make a little balloon off to the side, and that's their endowment. Oh, yeah. What advice would you give to a um, fundraising professional in a smaller organization who might feel like that they don't have the resources to really support donors at the level that you're talking about? What can they do? I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Is that because the majority of nonprofit organizations are not multi-million dollar organizations. Exactly. They might have one, if they're really lucky, to fund development people. Exactly. How can they use volunteers, their board? How can they implement what you're talking about with limited capacity? This is a good question, and it's a question that's asked me very, very frequently sure by the people in those offices. I would imagine. So this is what I recommend. Number one, if you have a group of donors who've given you over time, let's say 15, 20, 25 years, make an honorary group of them. Make an honorary recognition society. Okay, idea. we're going to ask all of our donors who've given, and, and you make the, the limit, the time frame, who've given us 25 years, we're going to invite you to a special luncheon. We're going to include your names in our annual report. And at the luncheon, we're going to tell you how you can endow your gift forever. What are the various tools? We're going to ask you to come for lunch once or twice a year. So we're going to recognize these people in multiple ways. Another thing that I think small um, shops really need to do, number one, they need to graph their donor according to the donor life cycle map to see where their gaps are. Mm -hmm. I've worked with countless organizations, and when they actually put their data into this donor life cycle map, what do they find? They have 10% first-time donors, 2% second-time. It really shows them where they have to start focusing. focusing their energy, of course. M many yeah. people don't have anybody in second-year active. That's where the volunteerism begins. 
So they have to ask themselves, what volunteer opportunities can I create in order to persuade individuals to participate and come closer to us? And move through the cycle. Right. right exactly. And the last thing I like to say to everybody, if you have a first-time donor, no matter what the size of the gift, don't write them a letter, dear friend, thank you. Write them a letter, dear so-and-so, and make it personal. Thank you so much for joining our family of donors with this first gift. Change that letter if the person makes a second gift. Thank you so much for continuing to give to us and making a second gift, etc. throughout the map. There are things that one can do that are inexpensive but are strategic in terms of maintaining donors. And so this is one of the exact reasons why we decided to use your book. <laughs> in one of our graduate courses where we're really teaching about donor cultivation, relationship building, and communication. And your book has been a really tremendous asset to that.